story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, brings you Dragnet on both radio and television. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A 38-year-old woman disappears. She leaves her sister and her four children behind. There's evidence of foul play. Your job, find her. In Fatima, the difference is quality. Yes, in Fatima, the difference is quality. Prove it yourself today. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One, Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs. 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And in Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Definitely the best quality in its class, but the same price as the cigarette you're now smoking. Buy Fatima in the bright, sunny yellow pack. Best of all, king-size cigarettes. The documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, June 3rd. It was overcast in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from communications, and it was 8.15 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Joe, what's doing? Hi, Brian. You seen Ed? He went down the hall a minute, said he'd be right by. Oh, thank you. I don't see anything in the book. Nothing new, huh? Not much. Pretty slow. How's your mother, Joe? She wasn't feeling too well. No, she's not, as a matter of fact. The doctor says it's anemia. It's going to take a little time to get over it, I guess. Oh, sorry to hear it. i got to do some checking down at the auto desk. If I get any calls, have me switch it down there, will you? Yeah, I sure will, Brian. Thanks. You betcha. Oh, excuse me, Ed. Pardon me, Tom. Hi, Ed. What'd they give you? Missing report, woman. How about the mail? No, it's nothing. Is that the missing report there? Yeah, it's all here. Some woman out on 64th Street. Name's Rose Baker. She's been gone about a week. Mm-hmm. Last seen Tuesday, May 27th, 10 p.m. Who's this that made the report? Carl Shelton? Who's he? It's her boyfriend. Miss Baker's husband died about five years ago. She's been running around quite a bit since then. Had a lot of man trouble. She disappeared before then, huh? Yeah, half a dozen times. Never been gone this long, though. Holmes took this report from Shelton. He gathered Miss Baker's not too stable. She's known to drink quite a bit. Doesn't seem to care anything for her home or kids. Yeah, I see it here. She has four children. They're living with her aunt, Mrs. Baker's sister. It's kind of a funny arrangement, isn't it? Yeah. Baker woman packed her bags and walked out of the house about a year ago. Her sister's been taking care of the kids ever since. Mother comes back for a visit once in a while. Mm-hmm. This address we've got on Mrs. Baker, it's the same address as her boyfriend, Carl Shelton. Yeah, it? that's right. They both have apartments in the same building. Uh, is this a recent picture, Miss Baker? It's supposed to be, yeah. It's a nice-looking woman, huh? Yeah. Sister's listed here as the last person who saw her. Well, how's that? Baker woman still wasn't living at home, was she? According to the sister, Mrs. Baker came over to the house to see her the night she disappeared sometime around 8 o'clock. Two of them had some business to talk over. Mm-hmm. Seems the sister had a check for $400 she got from selling some furniture. She claimed the kids had been sick. She had doctor bills to pay. You mean Mrs. Baker's sister took care of things to that extent? Apparently. Anyway, after the sister got the check for selling the furniture, Mrs. Baker wanted half the money. Sister said that's why she came to see her that night. Two of them got in the car and went out to find somebody to cash a check. Mm-hmm. You want a drink of water? No, no thanks, Ann. Where do you get a $400 check cashed at 8 o'clock at night, would you know? Uh, sister said Miss Baker knew somebody could cash it for him. Turned out the person couldn't cash it. Sister stopped at a bar for a glass of beer. Miss Baker took the car and went to look up somebody else she thought could cash it. That was it. Miss Baker hadn't been seen since. Who was this somebody else? No idea. Sister claims she doesn't know. Miss Baker didn't tell her. Sounds like Mrs. Baker wanted a whole check, wouldn't you say? That's what the sister figured when Mrs. Baker didn't come back. She finished the glass of beer, left the barn, started walking home. Two blocks from the house, she found her car parked. No sign of Mrs. Baker. Car keys were in the glove compartment, so it's a sister's share of the money. $200 in cash. 
Well, how about the firm that issued the check? Did they get it back canceled? Yeah, a couple of days ago. There's Baker's endorsement on the back. Yeah, sounds pretty wild, doesn't it? Whole thing does. Talked to half a dozen people who saw Miss Baker that night. None of their stories jibe. What do you mean? Her boyfriend, Carl Shelton, he claims Miss Baker told him she was going out of town for a few days with a girlfriend. They check it out? Yeah. Girlfriend didn't know anything about it. Then they talked to a woman who works with Miss Baker. She says, yeah, the Baker woman was planning a trip. Miss Baker mentioned anything about it to her sister? No. Sister said Miss Baker told her just the opposite. Said she was getting out of her apartment into a new place. She was going to spend the next couple of days moving. They checked the boyfriend, Shelton. She said if Miss Baker was moving, it was news to him. Well, either she's a liar or one of her friends are, huh? It's all bollock stuff. No two stories anywhere near alike. What do they figure for a motive? They got a line on anybody who might have wandered out of the way? Big field to pick from. She fought with Carl Shelton. She fought with his sister, some of the people she worked with. She had three or four other men around town on the string, too. Any one of them could have wanted her out of the way. All her relatives have been checked out and all her friends, places she'd be most likely to go. All checked. Not a trace of her, nothing. Yeah, uh, I guess we better start moving on it. A lot of ground to cover. Mm-hmm. See if we can't straighten out some of those stories. One thing's sure. Somebody's lying. 8.35 a.m. Before we left the city hall, we checked with Sergeant Holmes and missing persons who'd taken the report on Rose Baker's disappearance. He had nothing to add to what was in the report and what he'd already told Ed. First on the interview list was the sister of the missing woman, Bernice Marin. She was employed as a saleswoman for a grocery supply firm. We called at the home where Miss Marin lived with her four nieces and nephews, but there was no answer. The next-door neighbor told us that Miss Marin was working that she usually didn't get home until 4.15 or 4.30 in the afternoon. In the meantime, we figured we might as well check the next name on the list, Mrs. Baker's boyfriend, Carl Shelton. We'd already checked him through R&I, and he had no record. We drove out to his address, a three-story apartment house on 64th Street. Shelton's apartment was on the main floor rear. He answered the door in his bathrobe and slippers. He told us that he was employed at one of the local oil refineries and that this particular week he was working the graveyard shift, 11 at night until 7 in the morning. He showed us back to a small kitchen at the rear of the apartment. While we questioned him, he fixed a percolator of coffee and put it on the stove. You sure about Miss Baker's plans, are you? She never mentioned anything to you about moving out of the apartment house here? No, never. Somebody's handing you a line there. If Rosie was going to move, she'd tell me about it. Just a minute, i got to get that coffee. It looks about done. You fellas want some java? Got a whole pot full here. Mm, no, no, thank right. you. How long do you say you've known Miss Baker? About a year, year and a half. We got along pretty good. She'd right from the start. Sure don't understand her taking off like this. Ms. Baker ever talked to you much about the family? Her sister, four children? I mean, did she see them regularly? Seem to get along with them all right to you? I don't think I'd know that. Rosie never had much to say about them. The only thing I could gather was that she just got sick of the routine, you know. Keeping up a house, doing the wash, mopping, dusting, taking care of four kids. She just checked out. That's all. Let her sister Bernice take over. Mm-hmm. If you ask me, she never should have had a family to begin with. Rosie isn't the kind. She's a party girl, likes a good time, you know what I mean? One thing I don't understand, Shelton, you said a minute ago you couldn't figure out Miss Baker's going off like this. When you filed a missing report on her, you said she was planning a trip out of town. Yeah, that's right. Well, isn't it possible she might have taken off without telling you? No, I don't think so. She'd have told me. She's planning a trip, all right, but she wasn't going to leave till the next night, Wednesday night. She's going to pick up this girlfriend of hers, Iris, and the two of them were going to take the bus down to Laguna for a couple of days. Well, it's our understanding this girlfriend, Iris, didn't know anything about the trip. Can you explain that? I don't know. I guess Rosie forgot to tell her. Can't figure these women sometimes. Maybe she was going to phone her Wednesday morning. She knew Iris could get away almost any time. And you think it's possible she might have gone down to Laguna by herself? No, that's not like Rosie. Besides, before I went in to report her missing, I called a couple of places down Laguna where Rosie usually stops at. They hadn't seen her. Possible she might have gone some other place? No, without telling me, no. Besides, she wouldn't go alone. I know that. Sheldon, we understand Mrs. Baker was friendly with two or three other men around town. You think it's possible she might have gone someplace with one of them? Sheldon? No. No, I can't buy that. If it was eight months ago, I'd say maybe, but not now. Why not? Well, we had it out, that's all. It was all settled. She wouldn't do anything like that again. You're pretty sure about that, are you? Yeah, positive. I don't get it at all. She wouldn't do that to me, taking off, just packing up and leaving. Rosie wouldn't do that to me. Well, she's got four children. Yeah, she did it to them. We questioned Carl Shelton for another half hour, but he failed to come up with anything in the way of a definite lead. 10.40 a.m., we drove to the home of the missing woman's girlfriend, an Iris Kirby. Two things she was pretty definite about. She knew nothing about an out-of-town trip Mrs. Baker was supposed to have planned for the two of them. And secondly, she had no use for Carl Shelton. 
She told us that Shelton was her ex-boyfriend and that she had introduced him to Rose Baker and that shortly after that he dropped her. A few weeks later, Shelton began to keep steady company with Mrs. Baker. Outside of her personal grievance against Shelton, Iris Kirby had nothing to offer in the way of a lead to the whereabouts of her friend. 11.30 11.30 a.m., we got in the car and headed for the factory in the south end of town where Rose Baker was employed. We stopped off on the way for lunch, a bowl of soup and a sandwich. Ed had a cheeseburger and a piece of pie. Before we left, we checked the office to see if there were any calls. Nothing. The place where Mrs. Baker worked was on Santa Fe Avenue, a one-story building covering almost half a block. They manufactured men's work clothes, shirts, and overalls. We checked with the personnel office. We asked if Rose Baker had any friends that she worked with. We were told that there was a Mildred Dunn who was a fairly close friend of the Baker woman. Ed and I waited in the office while they sent down to the plant for Mildred Dunn. Ms. Dunn? That's right. Police officers, my name's Jacobs. This is my partner, Sergeant Friday. How do you do? How are you? I'd like to ask you a few questions about Rose Baker, Mrs. Dunn. I understand you're a pretty close friend of hers. Yes, that's right. I've known Rose ever since she came here. She worked on the machine next to me. she come home yet? No, not yet. Do you remember Ms. Baker saying anything to you about taking a trip, Ms. Dunn? I mean, just before she disappeared? Yes, she did. She'd been looking forward to it. That's probably where she is, don't you think, off on her trip? Well, we don't know, ma'am. Did she mention anything definite about the trip to you, where she was going when she was leaving? Well, I think she was going to Laguna Beach. It's hard to tell. She's always kidding around, Rose is. Once she said she was going to fly to Switzerland for a vacation. San Moritz. She's always kidding around like that. Oh, that's so? Like once, when she had a date with Fred, she said she was going to the pump room in Chicago. You know, just being funny. I see. Who is this Fred, Mrs. Dunn? Fell in the shipping department, Fred Lyons. Nice fella. He and Mrs. Baker see much of each other? They used to, yes, quite a bit. I don't know if they were serious about each other. I, I thought they were till the last month or so. Maybe they had a tip or something. Maybe Rose got tired of him, I don't know. But you do think the two of them were serious at one time? Oh, yes, it wasn't more than a month ago. Then all of a sudden they weren't sweet on each other. At least Rose wasn't about him. She told me that. Mm-hmm. Well, I guess we better check on him, then. Mm-hmm. Is this Fred Lyons working today, do you know, ma'am? Oh, no, he quit last Tuesday. 1.15 p.m. We finished questioning Mildred Dunn and we went back to the personnel office to get Fred Lyons' description and the last known address. We checked out the address, but Lyons had moved out the previous Tuesday and left no forwarding address. We questioned the landlady, looked over his rooms, checked through the neighborhood and talked to everybody he knew. We found nothing to indicate that Lyons had anything directly to do with Rose Baker's disappearance. But we did find out that he knew Mrs. Baker and that he thought quite a bit of her. We went back to the office, got out a broadcast and an APB on Lyons. Want to check the book, Joe, see if we got any late calls here? Yeah, sure. I'll get it. Right. Homicide, Jacobs. That's right. Mm-hmm. Are they sure? What was that? All right. Thank you. Got some? Yeah? Hollywood Division. Woman's purse found in a vacant lot out there. High school kid found it. A lot of identification inside. Yeah. Rose Baker. 3.15 p.m. The purse was brought downtown to the crime lab for detailed examination. Brian and Barrett from Homicide went out to interview the boy who found the purse and to check the neighborhood where it was discovered. Meantime, Ed and I drove out to talk to the missing woman's sister, 36 years old, Bernice Marin. She and her sister's four children lived in a five-room stucco house just off Exposition Boulevard. We got there shortly after Miss Marin returned home from her job. Her two older nephews were out in front cutting the lawn. She showed us into a neatly kept living room where we interviewed her. She was a plain-looking woman, brown hair, gray eyes. She showed little concern about her sister's disappearance. I gave up trying to keep track of her a long time ago, Sergeant. I haven't any idea where she's gone. I used to worry about her. I don't anymore. Well, how about that purse of hers that was found this afternoon, Miss Marin? Wouldn't you say that makes it a little unusual this time? I don't think so. She loses things all the time. I don't know what she does when she goes off in those things. I don't want to know. Gets drunk and does a lot of fooling around, I suppose. She's lost two or three purses the same way. What about last Tuesday, the night she disappeared? you notice if she'd been drinking then? Yeah, I got the idea she'd had a couple of highballs before she came over. She wasn't drunk, but she wasn't feeling any pain. I'll say, would you excuse me? I want to yell at the kids out there. Yes, ma'am. Frank! Frank, that's enough of that playing around out there. Let's get started pushing that lawnmower, huh? Okay, just try out a new system. Almost half done now. You better hurry it up. You still got the backyard to do, remember? Yeah, okay. The only good thing that came out of that marriage, Sergeant, those kids out there. Yes, ma'am. There's two more besides Frank and Bobby, the girls, my nieces. One's nine, one's seven. Mm -hmm. Marvelous kids. Girls are just as pretty as pictures. I'm glad I have a chance to take care of them. I guess I just like kids. Can't understand it when people don't appreciate them. 
I don't have a family of my own. Oh, I see. Miss Marin, when you were with your sister last Tuesday night, you say she didn't mention anything at all about taking that trip out of town? No, just the opposite. Like I told you. Said she was moving out of her apartment into a new place. That's why she needed the money. Mm -hmm. Well, what's the story about this money your sister came to pick up, Miss Marin? I don't think I quite got that clear. Well, we had this baby grand piano that my mother gave Rose and me just before she died. Kids have been sick the last couple of months, one thing and another. I needed a little money to catch up on some doctor bills, so I sold the piano. I hated to do it, but the bills had to be paid. Mm -hmm. Well, Rose found out about it somehow, and she wanted half of the money I got for the piano. She wanted the money for herself. Can you imagine that? She wasn't even willing to pay for her own kids' doctor bills. It'd be different if I was charging her to take care of the kids. I'd just do it because I like them. Mm-hmm, I see. Well, anyway, she found out about it, and I had to split the check with her. The whole thing was for $400. I understand your sister got the check cashed that night, that correct? Yeah, that's right. It was 8 o'clock at night, but Rose said she knew somebody who'd cash it. She wanted the money that night. And to save an argument, we got in the car and went to see this friend of hers, some bartender. He couldn't cash the thing, so Rose took the car and went out to look up another friend she thought would cash it. I didn't want to go chasing all over town with her, so I stayed at this bar and had a beer. Mm-hmm. And that's the last time you saw your sister, is it? Yes, yeah, I waited a couple of hours, and then I walked home. And two blocks from the house, I saw my car pulled up at the curb, right on Exposition Boulevard. Car keys were in the glove compartment. $200 in cash right under them. No sign of Rose, though. Well, what time was it when you got back to the house, you remember? It was after 11. Close to 11.30, I think. I went right to bed. And since that time, you've had no indication where your sister might have gone, no phone calls, no letters, no word from one of her friends who might have seen her? No, not a thing. If she's in trouble, you can understand why. It's been coming for a long time. Last five years, going downhill all the time. She's no good, Sergeant. I don't know how it happened. She's just no good at all. Um, thank you very much, Miss Barron. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, not at all. No trouble. I guess I'd better get dinner started for the kids. Well, if you hear anything about your sister, we'd appreciate it if you'd give us a call. Yes, all right. It's going to be the same old story. Same thing all over again. You can bet on it. Ma'am. She'll come back when the money's gone. <laughs> 5.15 p.m. Ed and I drove back downtown and went directly to the crime lab. The missing woman's purse, which had been found in the vacant lot out in Hollywood, had been examined thoroughly. They'd found nothing that had provided us with a new lead. We checked communications, but there was still no answer to the APB we'd gotten out on Fred Lyons, the man who'd worked with Rose Baker and who dropped from sight the same day she did. 5.30 p.m. We got back to the squad room. Hi. Hi, Brian. You just got back? Yeah. You get the word? No, what's that? Mrs. Baker, they just found her body. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. Comparison proves Fatima quality. Prove Fatima quality yourself today. Compare Fatima with any other king-size cigarette. One. Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters for your protection. Two, Fatima's length cools the smoke for your protection. Three, Fatima's length gives you those extra puffs, 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And in Fatima, you get an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Friends, to show our confidence in Fatima, we make this money-back guarantee. Buy a pack of Fatima's. Enjoy Fatima quality, extra mildness, and superbly blended tobaccos. If you're not convinced Fatima is better than the king-size cigarette you're now smoking, just return the pack and the unsmoked Fatimas by August 1st, 1952, for your money back plus postage. Fatima, Box 37, New York 1. Remember, because of its quality, its extra mildness, its better flavor and aroma... More smokers now insist on Fatima than ever before. Insist on the best. Fatima. Extra mild and soothing. Plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Smoke Fatima. Best of all king-size cigarettes. June 3rd, Monday, 6 p.m., the body of 38-year-old Rose Baker had been discovered in the Hollywood Hills area. Approximately three-fourths of a mile from the intersection of Mulholland Drive and Oak Knoll Terrace, a dirt road branched off to the left of Mulholland and wound about 300 yards down the hill to a dead-end stop. Just below the guardrail, which circled the edge of the road, there were two eucalyptus trees. 
they overlooked a deep ravine covered with scrub oak and patches of laurel. Halfway down one slope of the ravine, they found the body of the missing woman. There were two bullet holes in the left side of the skull. There was another one at the base of the throat. In her clenched right hand, there was a 50-cent piece. The immediate area surrounding the body had been roped off, and Lieutenant Lee Jones and the crime lab crew were making their preliminary investigation. There was no sign of the murder weapon. The coroner arrived, and when the preliminary investigation was completed, the body was taken downtown to the county morgue. All clothing and personal effects were removed from the body and sent to the crime lab for detailed examination. Rose Baker's sister, Bernice Marin, was brought to the county morgue and identified the body. A few minutes after 10 o'clock that night, Ed and I got back to the office. I got it. Homicide, Friday. Is it Sergeant Friday? Yes, sir, that's right. This is Carl Shelton, Sergeant. You were out to talk to me this morning, you remember? Oh, yeah, Shelton. I heard about Rosie just a couple minutes ago. I got to talk to you, Sergeant. There's something I got to tell you. Is that so? Do you want to tell me now? Well, I don't want to tell you on the phone. I'll drive in to see you. I'll leave right now. Well, yeah, all right. Do you mind telling me what it's about? Yeah, I know who killed Rosie. 11.08 p.m. Carl Shelton arrived at the office. Ed and I took him down the hall to the interrogation room where he gave us his story. He told us, first of all, that he was well acquainted with most of the regular customers at the tavern where Rose Baker and her sister had first stopped to cash the $400 check. He told us one of these people, a Leroy Hansen, had contacted him after he read in the morning paper about Mrs. Baker's murder. I've known Leroy at least four or five years. He used to work with him. He wouldn't lie to me. What did this fellow tell you, Shelton? That's Leroy Hansen. He said he got to the bar a little after midnight. It had to be at least that, because Leroy doesn't get off work till 11.30. He said he saw Rosie sitting in a car parked a couple doors down from the bar. There was a woman in the car with her. He described her just like Rosie's sister. They were having a beef. And this friend of yours here, what Mrs. Baker and this woman were talking about? No, but he's smart enough to know a big argument when he sees one. He says they were really going to it. Is he sure about the time? He's got to be. Leroy works at a sheet metal plant south of town. He gets off at 11.30. Takes him more than a half hour to get in. Why should he lie about it? He wasn't even going to mention it till he found out she was dead. This woman he says Miss Baker was with, she fits her sister's description that close? Exactly. And there was a guy with Leroy. He'll back it up. If the sister says she wasn't sitting in that car with Rosie outside that bar after midnight, she's a liar. Well, she is if you can prove your story. Here's the phone. You ask Leroy. 11.22 p.m. We put in calls to both of the men who were supposed to have seen Rose Baker and her sister Bernice sitting in a parked car outside the tavern six nights before. Both of them corroborated Carl Shelton's story down to the last detail. They were especially certain about the time. Bernice Marin told us that on the night her sister Rose disappeared, she hadn't seen her after 9.15 p.m., and that she'd walked home and was in bed by 11.30. Both Leroy Hansen and his friend told us that they had seen Rose Baker and a woman answering her sister's description sitting together in a car parked outside the tavern. They were both certain at the time that it was well past midnight. We made a check on Leroy Hansen and his friend. As far as we were able to find out, there was no logical reason why they should lie about what they told us. Ed and I got in the car and drove out to the home of Bernice Marin, just off Exposition Boulevard. It was 20 minutes past midnight. We rang the front doorbell and got her out of bed. Oh, hello, officers. And who it was? Come in. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, you have to wait long before I answered. I sleep pretty sound. I'm afraid we'll have to ask you to get dressed, Miss Marin. I'd like to talk to you downtown. Why? What's the matter? Well, some more questions we have to ask you, ma'am. A few more things we have to clear up about your sister. It's pretty important. Well, I've told you everything I know. I don't like to go out and leave the kids alone at night. What is it you want to ask me about? Well, you told us the last time you saw your sister was about 9.15 last Tuesday night, Miss Marin. Yes, that's right. We've got a couple of people who claim they saw you with your sister after midnight Tuesday. You were sitting with her in your car parked outside a tavern. You're having an argument with her. At least two people saw you, and they'll swear to that. No, that couldn't be right. They claim it is? They say it was after midnight, and they saw me with Rose? Yes, ma'am, that's what they say. And you believe it? You believe it was me? Yes, ma'am, we do. You think I killed Rose, is that it? Yes, ma'am, we think so. How about it, Miss Byrne? It'll take me a minute to get my clothes on. I want to talk to the oldest boy, my nephew Frank. Would it be all right? Well, I'll have to go along with you. All right. This way, down the hall. All right. In here. I don't want to wake the other kids if I can help it. All right. Frank. Wake up, Frank. Frankie? Hmm? What do you want, Aunt Bernice? I hate to wake you up, Frankie. I'm going to have to go downtown tonight. I'm leaving now. In case I'm not here when you and the kids get up, I want you to take care of everything, all right, honey? Yeah, okay. What do you have to go downtown for? Well, it's something about your mother, Frank. 
Might take a little time. You see, the girls get after school on time in the morning, won't you? Bobby, too. The sandwiches are all made. They're in the icebox. All you have to do is put them in a paper sack, all right? Yeah, okay. Why do you have to go now? Can't you wait until tomorrow? No, I'm afraid not, honey. You take care of everything, huh? Make sure all the doors are locked. And don't forget to feed the dog. No, I won't forget. What's the matter? Is there anything wrong? No, of course not. Now, if something happens so I can't get back tomorrow, I'll call you on the phone, all right? Yeah, okay. You be sure and call, huh? I'll call you, honey. Go to sleep now. It'll be all right. You get some sleep. Good night, Frankie. Yeah, okay. Good night. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. I had to tell Frank what to do. The kids wouldn't understand. I mean, if they woke up and didn't find me here. Yes, ma'am. What'd you do with a murder gun, Miss Mann? Out in the garage, I'll show you. I had her four kids to raise. It's not easy. You know what it costs to feed them, put clothes on their back. It's not the kids I minded. They're wonderful. I love every one of them. I'm glad to get the chance to raise them. I never married myself. Never had any of my own. Mm Mm-hmm. Hasn't been easy at all, working all day, coming home and cooking for them, doing the wash, trying to keep the house clean. Rose never gave me a dime to pay a bill for her own kids, too. She gave us nothing, and she tried to take everything, tried to bleed me for my last dollar. She cashed the check that night and said she was going to keep all the money. I couldn't stand anymore. We argued, and I killed her. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, ma'am. We'll have to go. Yes, all right. Well, I do, Sergeant. Well, I say... I advise you to tell the truth. You'll get a fair trial. I know that. It's not what I mean. What do you mean? Inside there. What am I going to say? How will I explain it? Yeah. The kids. How do you tell four kids you killed their mother? The story you have just heard was true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On October 3rd, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 92, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, I make it a habit to carry two packs of Fatimas around with me. One's for my smoking, and the second one's for smokers I see with other king-size cigarettes. All I have to say is, here, compare Fatima. I know they're going to be sold on Fatimas the next time we meet. How about comparing Fatima yourself? You'll find Fatima's length filters the smoke 85 millimeters, cools the smoke, all for your protection. You get those extra puffs because Fatima is 21% longer than standard cigarette size. And Fatima gives you an extra mild and soothing smoke, plus the added protection of Fatima quality. Prove it today. Buy Fatima. When their aunt, Bernice Alberta Merrin, was apprehended on suspicion of 187 P.C., the four Baker children were taken into protective custody by juvenile authorities. Bernice Merrin was indicted for murder and entered a plea of self-defense. She claimed that at the time of the murder, her sister attacked her with a knife while they argued over the division of the $400 check. Bernice Merrin was tried in superior court by a jury composed of nine men and three women. She was found not You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police, W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Frazier. Heard tonight were Barney Phillips, Virginia Gregg, Vic Perrin. Script by Jim Moser. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all king-size cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Next, it's Counter Spy on NBC.